MBK 2 21 Drishta Dina encounters Drona Chapter 21 Drishta Dina encounters Drona beholding Bhima's son killed and laying like a hill on the battlefield, the Pandava shed tears of grief. To everyone's amazement, however, Krishna uttered loud war cries and laughed. Dancing on the terrace of Arjuna's chariot, he clapped his arms in happiness. He embraced Arjuna with tears in his eyes. Arjuna looked at him with surprise. Why, O oh Madhusudana, are you showing delight at such a time? Our troops are crying in sorrow. We also are grief-stricken to see Hedim Beast's son slain. O oh, all-knowing one, tell me truly why you have lost your mind. I consider your fickleness to be as incredible as the ocean drying up or Mount Meru walking, with his hand on his friend's shoulder, Krishna replied, O oh, Dhananjaya, I feel an overwhelming happiness. Now that Karna has discharged his Shakti weapon, you may consider him dead. No person could have confronted him in battle if, like Kordakaya himself, he stood with the Shakti in hand. By good fortune he has been deprived of his natural armor and now of the dart he received in exchange for the invulnerable coat of mail. He is now like an infuriated, venomous serpent stupefied by incantations, or like a fire with quenched flames, Krishna told Arjuna that ever since he had heard that Karna had received the Shakti, he had been in anxiety. He knew the weapon's terrible power. Even Arjuna would have been unable to check it. Now it had been spent Karna could not use it again. Arjuna looked at Gautatka Chak. The Shakti must surely be something extraordinary if it had brought down that mighty Rakshasa. Why, then, had Karna not used it earlier against him? Seeing Arjuna's mystified expression and understanding his mind, Krishna said, each day Dhritarashtra's sons would counsel Karna to use his Shakti and slay you, O poor thought, and he would come out firmly resolved to do so. It was I who confounded his attempts. Keeping you at other parts of the battle, I gave him little chance to release the dart. He was always awaiting his chance. It would not have been long until he encountered you in single combat. O oh, poor thought, now you need have no fear of that encounter, Arjuna realized that it must have been more than just Krishna's tactical maneuvers that had saved him Karna had surely had opportunities to whirl the weapon. His intelligence and memory must have been confounded by the indwelling super soul. The Pandava looked with wonder at Krishna. If he desired one's protection, then how could one be killed? And if he wished for someone's death, then who could protect a mute Hishthira was sorrowful to witness Gatotkacha's death. He sat down on the terrace of his chariot and wept Pima, his own heart rent with grief, tried to comfort him. Krishna went over to Yudhishthira and said, O son of Kunti, do not give way to grief at such a critical time. In this dread hour of night, our roaring foes are cheering and rushing at us again. Seeing you dispirited, our own men will lose heart for the fight. Yudhishthira wiped his eyes with his hands. You always see the excellent path of duty, O Keshava. We must surely remain in battle, despite reverses. But remembering the many services and kindnesses Bhima's son rendered us, my heart aches. That mighty armed hero was devoted to us and has laid down his life in our service. The affection I bore for him was no less than the affection I feel for Sehadev. The Sudha's son slew him before our eyes. The evil-minded Karna was also instrumental in Abhimanyu's death, as he spoke to Krishna, Yudhishthira looked out into the night. The battle still raged all around the fallen Gautatka Chakarna's illuminated standard could be seen moving among the Pandava forces, with fire-tipped arrows speeding away from him in all directions Yudhishthira's face set into firm lines. He got to his feet and took hold of his bow, the hand-carved horn studded with glowing gems. The Pandava king called out to Krishna as he moved off. Karna and Drona are destroying our army like a pair of infuriated elephants destroying a forest of reeds. O oh, Keshava, I think the time has come for them to die. I myself will advance against Karna. I cannot bear to see his prowess any longer. It seems Arjuna does not wish to kill him, so I will do it myself. After ordering Bhima to engage with Drona and his supporters, Yudhishthira instructed his charioteer to take him toward Karna. As he left, blowing his conch and twanging his bow, Krishna said to Arjuna, Lo, under the influence of anger your esteemed elder brother is advancing against Karna. It is not right that you should allow him to engage in a fight with the Sudha, whose death you have sworn to accomplish, 
Arjuna told Krishna to urge his horses on and to quickly follow Yudhishthira, but just at that moment, they saw Vyasadeva appear on the battlefield near Yudhishthira, who stopped his chariot next to the sage and got down to offer his obeisances. Vyasadeva touched his head in blessing and said, O foremost of the Bharatas, it is fortunate that Arjuna still lives, although he encountered Karna several times in battle. The Shakti with which Karna slew Gautatkacha was meant for Arjuna, and only by good fortune did he not use it on him. If a serious duel had taken place between Karna and Arjuna, he would surely have employed the Shakti. A great calamity would then have overtaken you. Gautatkacha has saved you from that today. The Rakshasa's death was ordained by destiny. Do not give way to wrath or sorrow. All beings in this world must die, pacifying Yudhishthira, the sage told him that the war was almost over. On the fifth day from now the earth will come under your sway. Meditate on virtue. Set your mind on forbearance, charity, truth and asceticism. O son of Kunti, victory always follows righteousness. After comforting Yudhishthira the sage vanished. The Pandava king, his anger abated, then called for Drishtadyuna and said, The time for which you were born has now come. Go and check the mighty drone out in battle. For this express purpose did you spring from fire, armed with a bow and sword, and encased in shining mail. Attack drone out at once. Do not fear. Let Sheik and D, the twins, your father Drupada, Virata, Satyaki, and all the Panchalas and Kekuyas go with you. Throw down the preceptor and in this ghastly war, Arjuna came up to Yudhishthira, who said, O Dhananjaya, I see now that you have been saved from disaster. It is Krishna alone who is our protector. You should now exert yourself to destroy Karna. Krishna is advancing against the preceptor. Only four or five Akshohinis remain on the field. This war cannot last much longer. The two brothers looked around the battlefield. It was just past midnight and the troops were tired. Some of them had lain down to sleep wherever they had been fighting, unable to continue any longer. Others fought on, blinded by sleep and swinging out wildly with their weapons. Warriors were slain while almost unconscious from fatigue, not even feeling the blows which ended their lives. Seeing the soldiers' condition, Arjuna rode out into their midst and called out, You men are all oppressed by drowsiness. If you like you may desist from the fight. Lay down your weapons and your bodies. When the sun rises we may resume the battle, praising Arjuna for his compassion, the troops stopped fighting and rested. The entire battlefield gradually became silent as the men lay down to sleep on the ground or on the backs of their slumbering elephants and horses. Others lay on the terraces of their cars, their bows and swords lying next to them. Stilled by sleep, the powerful warriors and their animals lay with their many ornaments gleaming in the moonlight. The field appeared beautiful, like the work of a skilled artist. Gradually the sky glowed red and the sun rose from the eastern hills. As the sun illuminated the field, the troops stirred and again rose for battle. The two sides were still intermingled in the positions where they had last fought. Stretching their bodies and rubbing their eyes, they bowed toward the east and offered prayers to the sun god. Then, mounting their chariots and taking up their weapons, they regrouped into their respective divisions and waited for the order to recommence the fight. Duryodhan had not been happy with the decision to rest for the night, but the other Karu chiefs had disagreed with him. He had wanted to seize the advantage gained by Gautatkacha's death. The huge Rakshasa had killed thousands of warriors as he fell, evening the odds between the two armies. Duryodhan was infuriated that the Kauravas had not been able to gain the upper hand when they had the chance. Going to Drona he said harshly, you should have shown no quarter to our weakened enemy. You should not have permitted our troops to follow Arjuna's order. Again and again you have spared the Pandavas. This is my own ill luck, Drona looked angrily at the prince. Here I am, still clad in armor and striving to kill your enemies, and I will do whatever can be done by the might of one's arms. Still, I do not see that we will defeat the Pandavas, especially Arjuna. If he comes at us in a wrathful mood, we will all be swiftly dispatched to Yamaraja's mansion. How is it that you fail to understand this truth, O king, when you have seen it so many times with your own eyes and rage to hear Drona praising Arjuna again? Doryodhan replied, barely able to control his voice, O teacher, today, assisted by Dushashana, Karna and my uncle Shakuni, I will slay Arjuna in battle, Drona laughed. May good befall you, O Bharata. Your words befit a fool. 
What presumptuous Kshatriya would venture to fight with Arjuna, who stands with Krishna by his side and the Gandiva in his hand? Has any man ever returned safely after challenging Arjuna? Surely you have no intelligence. Suspicious of everyone, you are cruel and rebuke even those who work for your cause. Go and fight, then, and prove your boastful words in battle. You have declared many times that you will crush the Pandavas. Today we will see you prove your claim. Take your uncle, who prefers to fight with Vice and the vain Karna, and stand before Arjuna and his brothers. There they are, waiting for you. Go and do what should be done by a brave Kshatriya. You have enjoyed this life to the full. By offering sacrifices and giving charity, you have no debts. There is nothing to stop you. Go and fight without fear, Drona turned away. Nothing gave him greater pain than fighting for this arrogant prince. What sinful acts had he performed in previous lives that he was now compelled to side with Duryodhana against the Pandavas? Riding into the remaining Kauravas, Drona gave the order to fight. The warriors cheered, blew on their conches, and beat their drums. Then they moved off in a body toward the Pandavas, determined to fight to the death. On that fifteenth morning, Drona fought with Drupada and Varada. The two monarchs stood at the head of the Panchala and Shidi armies. Disregarding them both, Drona began slaughtering their troops. He quickly caused a terrible destruction among the warriors, annihilating five thousand chariot fighters in less than half an hour. The Pandavas looked at Drona as if he were fire. Whichever way he directed his weapons he routed the Pandava army. None could approach him as he let go his flaming arrows. A group of three Panchala princes, sons of Drishtaduna and Shikandi, valiantly charged at Drona. They struck him with hundreds of fierce shafts, but he did not waver. Licking his lips, Drona cut down all three princes at once with razor-headed arrows, and they fell headlong to the earth. Drupada and Virata charged at Drona from both sides. They afflicted him with long shafts that made him rock on the terrace of his chariot. Drupada hurled ten lances in swift succession, followed by ten steel shafts tipped with fire. Drona cut down all the missiles and struck Drupada on the chest with three arrows. Drupada angrily threw a dart, decked with gold and gems, at his foe. But Drona cut it to pieces with his shafts. Deciding to slay his opponents, who themselves had killed so many of the Kauravas, Drona took out a couple of crescent-headed arrows forged entirely of steel. Uttering mantras, he released the arrows Drupada and Viratna's heads were severed. As the two old kings dropped lifeless from their chariots, Drona returned to slaughtering their armies. Drishtaduna, witnessing the deaths of both his sons and his father, screamed out to the troops, Attack Drona! May any man who turns away from Drona today lose the merits of all his pious acts. Cheered by Drona's killing of the two Pandava generals, Doryodhan came to his assistance with Karna and Chakuni. Doryodhan's remaining brothers also surrounded Drona to protect him from attack. The Kaurava warriors knew that Drishtaduna would now try his utmost to fulfill the prophecy that said he would kill Drona. In the meantime, Bhima became senseless with rage upon seeing Drona destroying the Pandava forces. He came up to Drishtaduna and spoke harshly. What man regarding himself a Kshatriya would stand by and watch his sons and father being slain? Having uttered a terrible oath in the assembly of kings, why do you not act upon it? There stands your sworn enemy, like a sacred fire with arrows and darts for its fuel and the bodies of men for its libations. If you will not slay him, then I will do it myself. Stand aside. I will dispatch this old Brahmin to Yamaraja's abode at once, Bhima broke away from Drishtaduna and rushed into the Korava's midst. He released torrents of shafts that swept away the fighters opposing him. Drishtaduna, chastened by the rebuke, followed him, trying to fight his way through to Drona, who was now surrounded by a large number of Korovas. The Pandava forces came up behind him and the two armies merged in a frenzied melee. As the two armies clashed, the sky was screened with dust and everyone thought night had again set in. The warriors climbed over dead bodies to reach their foes, swinging their swords and thrusting forward with sharp-tipped spears. Chariots could make no progress. Horses reared, unable to move in any direction. Men screamed in pain and then fell, dying, calling out to their loved ones. Many brave warriors lay mortally wounded and filled with joy, awaiting their ascent to the celestial regions or Juna, looking for his chance to confront Karna, encountered Drona first. As Bhima and Drishtaduna beat a path through the Kauravas toward the preceptor, Arjuna came up behind them. 
while Bhima was engaged with Duryodhana and his brothers and Drishtadyuna was held by Ashvatthama, Arjuna sent his gold-winged arrows at Drona by the thousands. A mighty battle ensued between teacher and pupil that astonished the onlookers. They appeared like two dancers on a stage, exhibiting their most wonderful motions. Arrows flew through the sky like flocks of swans. Meeting in the heavens, the shafts exploded in showers of sparks and fire Drona invoked every celestial weapon he knew, but as soon as they issued from his bow Arjuna destroyed them Drona smiled and applauded his prowess. In the sky Siddhas and Gandharavas watched in wonder and praised both warriors. They could not perceive any difference between them as they stood releasing their weapons without pause. Neither could gain an advantage over the other. The gods considered the fight to be as if Rudra had divided himself in two and waged war against himself. These two are neither humans nor celestials, they declared. This is a battle of Brahma energy which transcends all earthly powers. If they desired, these warriors could destroy the universe, while Arjuna and Drona fought, Drishtadyuna advanced steadily toward them, intent on killing Drona. He was followed by the twins, who were met by Kritavarma and Kripa. The heroes contended while the armies fought savagely around them Satyaki, following Arjuna's path, came upon Duryodhana. Long ago in Hastinapura, when Satyaki had come to Drona's school, they had been friends. Even though Satyaki had become Arjuna's disciple, he had maintained his relationship with Duryodhana. The two men gazed at one another across the field, remembering their youthful sports together Duryodhana called out, Ho oh there, dear friend. How karst is the duty of Kshatriyas? Fie upon might and the desire for wealth. O oh, foremost of Sini's race, in the days of our childhood you were more dear to me than life itself. Alice, all those days of friendship become nothing on a battlefield. Impelled by rage and covetousness we stand here bent on each other's death. Alice, where have the carefree days of our youth gone? Satyaki lowered his bow and called back, that he must fight even with his preceptor has always been a Kshatriya's duty. O king, do not hesitate. If you love me, then slay me without delay. By doing so, you will launch me into the regions of the righteous. Display your full prowess. I no longer wish to witness my friend's slaughter. Tears fell from Satyaki's eyes as he spoke. He knew the days of friendship he had enjoyed with the Pandavas and Kauravas were gone. Their friendly fights of the past were now in earnest. Bending his bow he shot a series of long shafts at Duryodhan, who immediately replied with his own arrows. The two men pierced one another repeatedly and roared in anger. A battle resembling that between Arjuna and Drona developed. The sky was filled with arrows as both warriors invoked their celestial weapons. Gradually, Satyaki prevailed over the Korava and Karna came to Duryodhana's rescue. Assisted by Karna, the king pulled clear of Satyaki, his body lacerated by arrows Drona continued to destroy the Pandava army as if appointed by death for their destruction. The oppressed troops' screams filled the air as he assailed them with countless blazing shafts. Witnessing Drona's power, Yudhishthira felt he could never become victorious. He met Arjuna in Bhima and revealed his anxiety. It seems that Drona will consume us. No one can check that mighty hero, Krishna replied, What you say is true, O King Drona cannot be checked as long as he stands with his weapons raised. But if he lowers them, he can be slain. I think if he hears that his son has been killed, he will lose all heart for the fight. Tell him that Ashvathama is dead. Then he will lower his bow and we will kill him, Arjuna was shocked. I cannot accept this, O Madhava, but Bhima, upon hearing Krishna's words, immediately broke away. He raced into a nearby core of our elephant division. At its head rode Imdravarma, the Malava ruler Bhima knew his elephant was named Ashvathama. Whirling his iron mace, the Pandava smashed the beast and slew it and its rider together. He then rushed over to Drona and bellowed out, Ashvathama is slain, Ashvathama is slain as he deceived Drona. His voice was tremulous and his heart wavered, but he knew it was Krishna's instruction, so he called out again and again, telling Drona that Ashvathama was dead. Hearing Bhima's words, Drona stopped fighting. His limbs seemed to dissolve like sand and water. However, recalling his son's prowess, he decided it could not be true Bhima was known to be capricious. It would not be beyond him to speak an untruth in anger or in jest. Drona rallied himself and resumed his assault on the Pandavas. Drishtadyuna had reached him and they had begun to fight again. 
Holding off Drishtaduna's attack, the Karu general continued annihilating the Pandava forces. He invoked the terrible Brahma weapon. Warriors fell to the earth like trees uprooted in a tempest. Heads and arms flew about as Drona's arrows fell on his enemies. In a short time, he had killed 10,000 chariot fighters before Yudhishthira's eyes, even while Drishtaduna assailed him with all his strength Drona stood on the battlefield like a blazing fire without a single curl of smoke. As Drona surveyed his ravaged foes, there suddenly appeared in the sky above him a group of rishis headed by Agni. His own father, Bharadvaja, along with Vasishtra, Vishvamitra, Gahudama, Kashyapak, and many other celestial sages stood in the sky in subtle forms. They addressed Drona in a single voice that only he could hear. You are fighting unfairly, O Drona, using celestial weapons against lesser warriors. It is now time for you to die. Cast away your weapons. You are a learned Brahmin and such cruelty does not become you. By employing the Brahma weapon to kill ordinary men, you have earned disrepute. Stop these sinful acts and stop fighting. Your days are now at an end. Drona looked around Drishtaduna was still near him, roaring out his challenge. Perhaps the time for the prophesied fulfillment had arrived Drona's arms fell to his side. He could not continue Bhima's words still troubled him, and the sage's speech pained him even more. Could Ashvathama actually be dead? Who could he ask and be sure to receive the truth? Seeing Yudhishthira not far away, the Karu general went toward him. He was the one to ask, Yudhishthira would speak no lie Krishna saw Drona coming toward Yudhishthira and said, Save us from Drona, O king. If he fights for even a half day more, your army will be finished. Under the circumstances, Falsehood is better than truth. Speaking falsehood in order to preserve life is not a sin. Krishna cited a scriptural passage that sanctioned lying under certain circumstances, including times when life was endangered. Yudhishthira reflected on Krishna's words. He could not ignore them. He had never in his life spoken even an ambiguity. The thought of a lie was difficult to face. Yet if Drona was not checked, his forces would be defeated. The Pandava remembered Drona's own prophetic statement at the beginning of the war, that he would be overpowered at a time when he heard something disagreeable from a creditable source. Reluctantly, Yudhishthira agreed to Krishna's suggestion. As the Karu preceptor approached him, he gave him the false news. Ashvathama is dead, he called out, adding inaudibly at the end, the elephant, as he could not tell an utter untruth under any circumstances. Until that time, Yudhishthira's horses seemed to move across the field without touching the earth. After he lied to drone up, his horses descended to earth. The sages looking on wondered why that was so. Some said that Yudhishthira's lie had been the cause, while others argued that his reluctance to obey Krishna's order was the reason. As soon as Yudhishthira spoke, Drona felt his heart sink into fathomless grief. His agony was compounded by the sage's words, which made him feel like he had offended the Pandavas. Distracted by sorrow, he moved away from Yudhishthira with his weapons lowered. Drishtad do not attack Drona was struck all over, but he did not resist. He was plunged into despair. Drishtad do not attacked him with even more force than the old Karu chief, incited to anger, finally raised his bow to fight back. Displaying his incomparable lightness of hand, he cut down all of Drishtaduna's arrows. He chanted mantras, invoking celestial weapons to destroy Drishtaduna, but they no longer appeared at his command. Marveling, he fired volleys of ordinary arrows at his foe. Suddenly, he saw that his stock of shafts, inexhaustible for the last fifteen days, was empty. Despondent, Drona decided to give up his life. He dropped his bow and repeatedly cried out his son's name. Looking over at the other Korus, he called out, O Doryodhan, O Karna, O Kripla, fight with all your power. I will now lay aside my weapons. Drona sat down in his chariot and assumed a meditative posture. With his eyes half closed and arms outstretched, he fixed his mind on Vishnu. As he entered into trance, he intoned the sacred syllable Om. The celestial sages, still stationed in the heavens, saw Drona leave his mortal frame and ascend toward the higher regions. It seemed to them as if another sun was rising in the sky as the Brahmin rose upwards Drishtaduna, unaware that Drona had already departed, saw his chance. Taking up a razor-edged saber he jumped down from his chariot and ran toward the Karu preceptor. All the warriors witnessing this called to him to stop, but he was not deterred. 
Amid cries of Alice and Fi, he jumped onto Drona's chariot with the sword held high. Grabbing hold of Drona's knotted hair, he dragged him in, with the great sweep of his saber, severed his head. He then threw the head toward the core of us and roared in joy, whirling his blood-soaked sword in the air. Arjuna had been shouting at Drishtad Yuna to capture Drona and bring him alive to Yudhishthira. He was mortified by Drishtad Yuna's viciousness. His heart melted with sorrow at the cruel killing of his beloved teacher Bhima. However, Chirdan ran over to joyfully embrace Drishtad Yuna. Yudhishthira was afflicted by different emotions. Overjoyed that the hostilities would soon end, he was nevertheless full of misgivings that Trona's death had been brought about by deceit. Like Arjuna, he was also saddened to see Drishtad Yuna mercilessly butcher his preceptor. The Kauravas were struck by grief and fear. Their all-conquering general was dead. Unable to believe it, they fled Oryodhan, Karna, Shakuni, and the Karu chiefs were overwhelmed by sorrow, and they ran along with their troops. As they rushed from the cheering Pandava forces, they encountered Ashvathama moving in the opposite direction, like an alligator swimming against a river's current. Surprised to see the Kauravas retreating, he stopped Doryodhan and asked, Why do I see our army flying, O King? Why are you and all of our other heroes running away? Surely some unthinkable calamity has befallen us. Doryodhan could not tell Ashvathama the news. He looked down and said nothing. Kripa came up to his side and Doryodhan said, O son of Siradwada, tell Ashvathama why we are fleeing, with tears flowing down his face. Kripa said, with that foremost of men drawn out our head, we have waged a great battle with the Panchalas, during which he has slain not less than 50,000 of their number. Penetrating into the pond of ranks, your father scorched our enemies like the destroyer himself. None could stand before him. Therefore, the Pandavas decided upon an unfair means to check your father. Informing him that you had been slain, O oh child, they deprived him of his senses and power drishted you not. When he saw him anxious and desisting from the fight, flew at him with sword held high. Even as the preceptor sat in mystic meditation, and as many warriors shouted at him to stop, Drupada's son lopped off his head. Thus did your father suffer death at the hands of a heartless warrior. This is why our troops are fleeing, Ashvathama cried out. His bow dropped from his hand and he fell to his knees. Insensible with rage, he shook like a tree in a tempest. His body burned and he knelt with his head between his knees for a few moments. Gradually regaining his composure, he stood up and said, O Doryodhan, how have the so-called virtuous Pandavas committed such an act? Today they will reap the consequences. Disregarding me. Drishtad Yuna has committed a heinous deed. I swear by truth that the earth will soon drink his blood, as well as that of Dharma's son. If I do not slay every last one of the Panchalas, I will not drag on my burdensome existence any longer. By any means, fair or foul, I will bring about the end of Drishtad Yuna and his followers. Ashvathama's face glowed as he spat out the words. Turn, O heroes, and fight our enemies. I will charge at your head and annihilate any who come before me. Today you will see me discharging fearful weapons equal to those of Rudra or Vishnu. I have in my possession the Narayana weapon, which my father gave me, and which was given to him by Shiva. He was told by that unfailing god that the weapon will destroy any at whom it is directed. I will use it today to crush the entire Pandava army. It can only be discharged once, and I have saved it for such a moment of desperation. Now the world shall see its power, Ashvathamor ordered repeatedly, inspiring new life into the core of us. They cheered him and rallied the retreating troops. To the beating of drums and the blasts of thousands of conchels, the core of our army turned back toward the pond of us.